Okay, so we're on to our next panel. Um, just as a reminder, we um, I think Senator Scott was planning to come by in around 10, 15. Um, if he's saying hi, if he's speaking, I'm not sure. Um, I think he's wanted just to swing by. So if we need to pause, we will. We'll just let you know. We'll be flexible. I think it's called Semper Gumby. You know, you just got to be always flexible. Um, and uh, but everything else it seems to be on time. So I am going to pass it over to you, Stephen. Thank you. And so, you know, renewable energy and one of the things about renewables is they are flexible resources. So it's fitting that I think the renewable <laughs> panel has to be flexible and certainly we're uh, good to accommodate um, Senator Scott. Right. Woody, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's good. But um, my name is Steve Sparber. I'm with a law firm, Nelson Mullins, which is actually um, headquartered in Columbia, South Carolina, based in the DC office. And uh, we have a great panel to talk about renewable energy policies and market designs and really looking at um, federal, state, and local policies, regulations, markets, and how um, those are impacting the development of renewables. So um, on the previous panel, Senator Scott mentioned that changing the status quo is difficult. Um, what is happening and really what is happening with respect to renewables is that the status quo actually has changed. Um, in large part, that's been driven by improved technological performance and costs um, declining over the last several years. And renewable energy really is mainstream at this point. Um, solar and wind by themselves are po poised to account for about 10% of all electric generation in the United States. Um, and combined with hydro, which is the um, largest and most established renewable resource um, that we have, I believe we had actually renewables count for more that generation than coal last, it just tipped over in terms of coal, gener uh, more, more generation than coal. So renewables are mainstream and they're here to stay. And what's interesting is that the my background previously, you know, I'm an attorney, but previously I was at PJM, which is the nation's largest wholesale power market. I was in-house counsel there for about four years before I joined Nelson Mullins. Um, a lot of the rules, regulations, procedures were really set up with a different paradigm in mind. Um, they weren't really, the, the system wasn't designed and the markets weren't set up uh, with large renewable uh, penetration in mind. And that has created some implicit and in some instances ex, explicit barriers for renewables. But the good news, um, I think for everyone in, to echo, in this room and to echo what the previous um, panel was saying is that competition um, free markets really are, I think, um, integral to the, in, to the success of renewables moving forward. And combined with smart state, local, federal policies, and yes, regulations, um, it can really be poised to uh, unleash renewable energy. And it's really um, great to see organizations like CRESS and um, the conservative and Republican Party in general getting on board because uh, any sort of um, promotion of clean energy in this country is going to really require uh, bipartisan solutions. And really, this shouldn't be a a partisan issue. It's really a, a pro-American, pro-innovation um, issue in my mind in terms of promoting renewables. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And uh, with that, we have a great panel um, uh, representing a wide range of experience. So let me pass it on to everyone to introduce themselves, and then we'll uh, get into the questions. Um, Selena, you want to start? Sure. Just my introduction? Yeah, just introduction, okay. who you are, where you're... Great. Yep. Selena Cunningham, Vice President and Chief of Staff at SIA, the nation's uh, Solar Trade Association. Hi, Rob Gramlich. I started a company called Grid Strategies. I worked for the American Wind Energy Association for 12 years before that and at FERC, and I do uh, power markets and transmission. I'm Jeff Leahy with the National Hydropower Association. I'm executive vice president there. Our association covers all water power technologies, hydro, pump storage, and marine energy. Hi, Emily Duncan with National Grid. We're an electric and gas company in the Northeast. We serve about 20 million people. We have 16,000 employees. Uh, and we are a member of, of NHA. Okay, thank you all. And just actually probably full disclosure for everyone in the room. Um, so in my practice, Nelson Mullins, I represent AWEA and also SIA um, on, uh, you know, on the kind of FERC and RTO related issues. I also a lot of solar industry mem uh, members themselves. So um, that is my background and some of the folks I represent, one of the reasons I'm here. So okay, we'll get you in the hydro industry. We'll get the, yeah. <laughs> We're, We'll happy to you know talk after I, my, my firm would not um, would be would be mad at me if I didn't take you up for that offer. So we'll talk afterwards. Um, no. So the first question though. So there have been a lot of obviously major headline issues um, 
you know, with, you know, talk climate change, green, new deal, green, real deal. Um, but there have been a lot of also significant issues that are really probably more in, in developments um, that are probably less known publicly, but are nonetheless extremely important to the growth of renewables. And just starting with Selena going down, what, what are some of the key issues that you've seen that are currently facing your industry and present either different challenges and opportunities that are may important but may not be as widely known? Sure. So just to give you a sense of the solar industry, we have 250,000 employees and bring $17 billion to the economy each year. Uh, we are a, a growing industry, and we believe the next decade will be incredibly uh, fruitful in terms of where we're going. Right now, we're at 2.3 percent of the electricity uh, market. We think that the next 10, uh, 10 years, we'll get to 20 percent, and that's because we're going to be working with both building out solar rooftop and utility scale, but also partnering with other technologies like storage, like hydro, to make sure that we can uh, get to a full uh, renewable energy uh, future. And so, in the in the current trends right now, we are knowing knowing that we want to get to a carbon tax or legislation down the road. Obviously, the, the public believes that we need to take action on climate change. We heard about polling earlier today. Uh, we have a long road in terms of trying to get that legislation through. But um, in the interim, we believe that the investment tax credit is the best tool that we have to continue um, to continually to deploy renewable energy, the solar investment tax credit. And so while uh, we work on that longer term plan, we uh, believe that the tax credit is a proven tool and uh, we'll be working to try to uh, extend it in, in, um, over the next six months or so. Obviously, there's a package in the Ways and Means uh, uh, Committee that Jeff will speak to in more detail. Solar is not a part of that. However, we believe that's a beginning conversation that will continue over the next several months. And then I'd also just take a minute to talk about our um, effort to cut red tape when it comes to permitting. So we talked about uh, early on the last panel, there was a discussion about um, HOAs. So there are lots of permitting processes that need to take place in order to put uh, solar on your rooftop. There are 13,000 different entities that are tasked with approving the permitting that goes into solar. And so we want to, we're working on legislation to make that an, an easier process, um, having best practices and a voluntary program to make sure that we can cut the cost for both consumers and businesses when it comes to putting solar and making it more accessible for people. There's a laundry list of other issues when it comes to infrastructure, um, wholesale markets, and, and making sure that we have uh, competition in them, and then also storage. We've talked a lot about innovation and both and tax credits on the storage front. We can get into that in more detail, but that's the current trends that we're working on now. Yeah, thanks. So um, there's a lot happening in the power market space that I think this group would be particularly interested in. Uh, there was a lot of talk this morning about sort of free markets. Um, how you set those up in electricity is not an easy question. It gets very complex very quickly. Um, but uh, suffice it to say, there are some very active power markets that are working very well. I saw in the ACC documents in the folder a reference to Texas. They have a great market. My former boss, who is uh, chairman of FERC, uh, he worked for uh, then Governor Bush setting that up in the beginning of the 2000s. And then he came to FERC, where I worked for him, trying to spread a lot of that to other regions. So it can be done. Uh, we have, I would say, very mixed success in how those markets are designed. We're kind of half in, half out in the market world. Um, but that's a, a really important uh, agenda area where I, I do think sort of, you know, free market environmentalism uh, really can actually, actually play out. We do have to, the thing about the electricity markets is, you know, somebody's got to be there as the air traffic controller to make sure uh, the right amount of, you know, the exact amount of generation meets the exact amount of load at every second of the day. So you have these group regional grid operators. Uh, Steve and I both work for one of them. Um, so there are market rules. It's not just let the market work. You do have to you know, design those uh, kind of the real time markets. And that becomes important for how wind, solar, hydro, and other resources actually participate and sell their services into those markets. <clears throat> It's just some quick um, statistics on the hydropower industry. We are the largest uh, uh, producer in 2018. We may be eclipsed in 2019 uh, by our wind brethren uh, as we go. Um, but there are eight, about 80,000 dams in the United States. Only 3% of them generate electricity. So there's a tremendous amount of opportunity, particularly on existing infrastructure. 
We also have about three to 400 projects, depending on the time frame, coming up for relicensing existing projects in the ne next 10 to 15 years. Um, and energy storage in the United States, 95% of it is hydropower pump storage, uh, and batteries and other technologies make up the rest. So with that sort of context, one of the biggest issues that we see in our industry uh, that's sort of off the radar screen, but, but Rob just mentioned about it, um, valuation and compensation of grid services uh, that hydropower provides, whether it's existing projects or proposed new projects. Uh, one of the things that our member companies have said to us, whether they're in the Northeast or in California, California is that um, the, those markets are not always set up or the market products don't necessarily take into account uh, properly, they, we would say, uh, the services that hydropower provides, both in terms of integrating other resources as well as, again, providing those uh, reliability res resiliency services as well, which I know for PJM, when they did a recent study in 2017, noted that hydropower was the top performing resource, providing 12 of 13 grid resiliency and reliability um, services. Next, I would echo regulatory permitting uh, improvements. We've been working on this for many years uh, at NHA. It can take upwards of 10 years uh, to get through a relicensing process or a licensing of a new project, depending on the project. And that just makes your project almost uneconomic and non-competitive right off the start when you can do another resource, which are great as well, um, uh, in half or less of that time frame. Uh, Tax incentives, uh, our, our resource has had our tax incentives expired for the past two years. That has put a huge damper on our industry because again, it's a revenue uh, uh, stream that we're not accessing that others, other resources have the ability to, to access and have been accessing over the course of the last several years. So we're supporting the work on the extenders package. And then lastly, I would just say, you know, again, at a state level, I think and at the federal level, looking at energy and climate policies and making sure that they apply across the board and hydro is maximally included in those policies. When we did state RPSs 20 years ago, there was a lot of existing hydro and not a lot of existing everything else. And that has tremendously changed now. And so how um, those existing hydro assets are treated in comparison to other existing renewable assets in terms of the policy policies on the state and federal level is really important and, again, sets up whether or not your projects will be economic. Great. Thanks. Um, so I think I, I promise I will get to large-scale renewables, but I do think it's important. Um, as a utility, obviously, we do a lot more than just renewables. And one of the things we've really been looking at um, is how do we reduce emissions and focus on the whole economy? We target the highest emitting fuels and sectors first and kind of optimize existing networks, kind of teeing off of what Jeff said. Um, and then primary for, for National Grid and for utilities across the country is how do we maintain affordable and reliable power for our customers? Um, and so understanding that and understanding that the three states that we primarily operate in, Massachusetts, New York, and Rhode Island, all of which have very aggressive targets um, for emissions reductions in, by 2030 and 2050, and, and New York even perhaps beyond that, we put out a report um, called our Northeast Energy Pathway about 18 months ago to focus on three different areas. Um, I think it's important to look at kind of the utility sector overall, and I see some of my, my EEI brethren in the audience, so I do have to make a pitch for the fact that as of year-end 2017, the electric power sector's CO2 emissions were 28% below a 2005 baseline and much lower than the transportation sector. And that's been the case since 2016. So while we think it's important to focus on power generation, and that's certainly an area that we're working very hard on, I also think it's important to look at the whole economy. Um, and so that's what our report did. We looked at three sectors. We looked at heat. Um, we're in a part of the country where we are still converting our customers from oil to natural gas, which we think is critically important to reduce emissions. Um, and so by 2030, we need to double the rate of energy efficiency retrofits and triple our rate of oil to gas conversions uh, in the Northeast. Transportation, that's the other sector I mentioned that has the highest, um, it's the highest emitting sector right now in our economy. We've discovered that we need more than 10 million EVs on the road by 2030 in the Northeast. We have about 75,000 today. So we've got a long way to go, which is one of the reasons that we're um, huge proponents of the EV tax credit, which was not included in the Ways and Means um, legislation that was released yesterday. And then finally, and, and what this panel is really focused on, is power generation. How do we ramp up renewable electricity, solar, wind, hydro, um, to achieve 67% zero carbon electricity supply by 2030? And we're at about 45% today. Um, so those are kind of the, the, the hot topics that we're focusing on. And, and it's not just power generation. It's the whole economy. And how can, we, how can National Grid play a role in that? 
No, thank you all. That's um, and as you can see, wide um, wide variety of perspectives from the industry. So it's great to have you know, especially also the end of the utility took a beating. In the previous panel, but it's great, Emily, you're here. Um, that wasn't to, us. <laughs> no, that was, was, was not national grid. Um, that's good. But another kind of second question for the panel, um, just to highlight for the audience, what are some recent success stories on the policy, regulatory, commercial front uh, that you feel have helped either with promoting renewables or helping deal with um, going towards um, clean energy and from a more holistic st stance? Uh, I just wanted to see what your thoughts were on that. Sure. So we had a whole panel on it, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. But South Carolina, I can't underscore enough what a success that was to have a Republican uh, legislature and governor sign a bill and a coalition work together to uh, make sure that the industry was on the same page, that the grassroots were on the same page, and that we were putting together a package that was supportive of jobs and the economy, and we were able to deliver it. When we're uh, struggling at the federal level, if we can continue to have that happen at the state level, that will be awesome. And we, uh, we're really supportive of that coalition effort. The second is uh, in 2018, there were tariffs put in place for solar for under Section 201. Just l last week or so, there was an exemption uh, thanks to uh, the Trump administration as well as Tillis and McHenry who helped us get an exemption for bifacial modules. And uh, the tariffs themselves are, are obviously hurting the, the solar industry. They're less, uh, we were able to get enough Republican support when they were put in place so they're moderated. They weren't as bad as they could have been. But this exemption that just came in will make sure that we get more efficient modules coming in and help the solar industry continue to, to flourish. Um, and then I would just comment on uh, the, uh, I think, yeah, I'll stop there. But those are the, those are the things that we have been, mo have been most successful lately. So I'm going to take this opportunity to talk about a success that, again, uh, arose from almost 20 years ago, setting up a market. And so there hasn't been really any recent policy change in Texas, but kind of that's the point. There's been all kinds of interests from people in changing or undoing or going back, putting the genie back in the bottle or setting up uh, kind of other regulatory mechanisms. But uh, Texas as a state has said, you know what, we have electricity markets and we're going to let them work. What happens is retail electric providers serve actual customers, uh, and then they go out and sign long-term contracts with, uh, with generators, uh, largely these days renewable generators. You got wind, solar, and storage are the, are the projects in the interconnection queue that are coming in. That's what consumers want. That's what um, you know, industrial customers, large CNI, commercial and industrial, as well as residential customers. Uh, are looking for, and they're they're building it. Now you do you do need long-term contracts to get uh, new generation finance, but those in Texas, that's the way it works. Is that those retail providers are signing those? So that's uh, that's the point. It was a it's a huge debate. If you follow the electric industry at all, or FERC, uh, you'll know there's there's huge debate around capacity markets, and then whether FERC and these regional grid operators should be mitigating state policy. And that is a total mess right now. There's a ten billion dollar market in PJM that is hung up. There's an auction supposed to happen in a couple of months. Nobody knows what the rules are. Um, and it looks like the fur commissioners are kind of throwing up their hands and have no idea what to do. Well, in Texas, they don't do that. They don't even try to, you know, mitigate the policies of the towns or other, you know, sub state entities. They just say, look, the grid operator is going to operate the market and everybody can buy what they want to buy. So, um, you know, they've got incredible renewable energy growth there. So it's a model worth looking at. And just to interject, Rob, just for audience's um, knowledge. So, you know, in the United States, the power sector is very balkanized. So you have seven grid operators around the U.S. that administer deregulated markets, about two-thirds of the country under them. Interestingly, Texas, because it's Texas, decided to set up its own grid way back when. So Texas's grid is actually not re regulated by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And the remaining third of the country in the southeast and South Carolina is – a key part of it, um, you still have the old vertically integrated model. Um, so just a little background information. But what's interesting, I think, for a group of predominantly conservatives and conservatives in the room is, um, and to show it really isn't a, a even a bipartisan issue or a partisan issue, pardon me, but, you know, Texas is a traditionally Republican state, and it has probably the most free market of all the electricity markets in the U.S., whereas a state like South Carolina or, you know, Georgia, Alabama, et cetera, in the southeast, 
which are also Republican dominated states politically, have some of the still have the mo- same monopoly, um, traditional vertically integrated monopoly utilities set up. So um, does show that even within the you know conservative Republican political states, there are a wide range of um, electricity market designs. But to echo what you said, Rob, and I think what the earlier panel said, that competition does work. And, you know, Texas has more wind. I think it has more renewables into it last year than even California, or it was, it was like California and Texas in terms of usually one, two, in terms of re- installed renewable. Um, two very different, like, ways to, to get that going through. California relies much more on subsidies and government mandates. Um, and, but Texas is the true free market model. Uh, there have been a tremendous, tremendous amount of renewable growth. So just wanted to highlight that for the audience. Um, Jeff, please go ahead next. No problem. I'm going to focus on a, a couple of federal um, activities that have occurred in the last couple of months. The first is the America's Waters Infrastructure Act from last year, the ironically named AWEA for my wind industry <laughs> friends who there was a lot of hydro in that bill. <laughs> uh, we did see provisions in there, regulatory provisions aimed at new, um, new project development, uh, particularly in closed loop pump storage building again on those non-powered dams, uh, as well as small conduit opportunities that we see across the West in particular uh, with irrigation canals and other water conveyances. Um, And we had, uh, I think, about nine or 10 other individual project bills. Many of them were our members uh, that passed as part of that uh, that bill. So that was was a really great success. And the fact that it was so bipartisan, I think, showing again uh, that the two parties can find common ground on many of these issues, which um, start to make a down payment on the larger climate issues uh, uh, and policies that we're looking to uh, to get into law. Uh, the other one that I wanted to mention was uh, DOE appropriations. In 2007, uh, the Water Power Technologies Office was zeroed out, and I think was probably the, the test case for zeroing out many of the EERE programs. Um, since that time frame, we've really been able to grow that program back, and uh, currently, we're looking at potentially a house mark this year of $125 million. So over the course of the last 12 years to get to that point, we think is a, is a great success, has been bipartisan and shows that innovation can happen in what are considered established techno- uh, technologies. And that is what's happening in the hydropower industry, where we're looking at new technology designs, new operational regimes, uh, new R&D advancements in environmental um, technologies associated with our our resource. And then the last thing I would just say in terms of successes is, um, and this is just general, but particularly in the states, I think it's more states are looking at clean energy standards, renewing their or revamping their renewable portfolio standards, looking at energy storage. Uh, We have seen a sort of a relook at hydropower and a reconsideration of how hydropower and pump storage uh, will be covered under those bills. Uh, Oregon passed a pump storage uh, resolution in which they showed support for deploying more pump storage in that state. So um, I think that's on, on a broad level, I think sort of that, that second look that people are taking at, at hydro has really been a success story and one that we need to grow. So anyways, where was I? Geronimo Energy. So we recently acquired Geronimo. They have hundreds of megawatts of solar and wind, um, large-scale renewable solar and wind uh, in the Midwest and a portfolio to grow um, to grow that. And so we're excited about that. However, in our states, um, we play an important role in kind of two areas. One is contracting for the, large, or the long-term power purchase agreements um, with renewable resources and then transmission. Um, and I'm grateful to have hydro and solar on the panel because that means I can focus on offshore wind which is where we are seeing a tremendous amount of growth um, in the Northeast. Um, so uh, so anyway, so Massachusetts, um, we recently uh, were part of the um, procurement process there for 800 megawatts of offshore wind, have signed long-term power purchase agreements with Vineyard Wind. Um, they recently issued around two in May for another 800 megawatts of offshore wind. And then, remarkably, um, the Massachusetts DOER just recently released a study asking for another 1,600 megawatts of offshore wind starting in 2022. Um, also in Massachusetts, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the procurement of over 9 million plus megawatt hours of hydro per year, which we're very excited about. Um, and then in Rhode Island, we also recently contracted with, um, signed a 20-year PPA with Revolution Wind for 400 megawatts of offshore wind. Um, in New York, we're waiting for NYSERDA to finish reviewing 
but they received 18 bids for 800 megawatts of offshore wind with an ultimate goal of 2,400 megawatts of offshore wind um, in New York. So we're seeing a huge amount of growth. And I think just to kind of underline um, the importance of National Grid's role there is to you know review the bids, look for the best possible price for our customers, and sign these long-term contracts, um, enabling these renewable resources to be built. Um, so we're kind of stepping in. The states are stepping in where some of these markets haven't been able um, to play a role necessarily. Um, on the transmission side, I think, you know, obviously we're in the, the infrastructure business. We invested $3.3 billion um, in this nation's infrastructure last year. We're forecast to do another um, $10 billion over the next few years. So it's a big priority of ours to invest in existing infrastructure um, and the resiliency of that infrastructure and then also to build out so we can bring on more of these resources. Um, and so our recent transmission investments, along with the other New England transmission owners, have resulted in over $5 billion in reductions in congestion charges and out-of-market payments to generators um, with additional cost savings of more than $600 million per year expected going forward. Um, and just also to highlight kind of what that means for energy costs, um, total annual energy costs in New England decreased from $12.1 billion in 2008 to $4.5 billion in 2017. And we think that our transmission efforts and bringing on some of these lower cost resources has been hugely beneficial in that room. No, thank you all. And we have about 15 minutes. So I just want to make sure we're on time. Okay. okay. Um, so last question for the group. And I want to, um, last question for the group, um, or at least plain question, which is I wanted to ask, um, over the next 12 to 24 months, what do you think are some opportunities, um, and we've touched on some of them, but for continued growth for renewables? And the one thing I want to also caveat that and add, add to that question, though, especially tying into the first panel, what are some thoughts you also that you also may have for the South Carolinians as they're looking to um, potentially further deregulate their market open up their um, their open up their markets for more renewables um, what can also be some lessons learned as they go forward um, with their own initiatives in, in South Carolina in particular that maybe they can learn from you know whether it's a state federal local level um, lessons learned so you know two part question but I want to also tie into the first panel. See if anyone has thoughts on that. But um, let's go to Selena. Sure. So in the next uh, short term, we're, I think, going to be part of this broader conversation on tax extens uh, extenders that we've talked about. Obviously, Senator Grassley is taking a thoughtful approach and putting together the task force that will be part of the conversation there to make sure that uh, we are looking ahead at how to best uh, make sure that we can bring renewable energy onto the uh, generation system and the ITC extension. Uh, we're, as I mentioned, planning on uh, phasing, stepping down uh, starting next year. And so the conversations that we have now will put the industry in a better position uh, to continue to uh, dramatically expand over the next decade or so. Um, and then I, I haven't, I didn't talk about this earlier, but workforce is a, is a critical issue for the solar industry. Uh, if we are going to get to 20% by 2030, we'll need to add 350,000 more employees. And solar uh, installers are the number one uh, job, new job in uh, eight states across the country. And we, wind and solar continue to kind of go back and forth in different areas. And th these positions don't necessarily require a college degree. We want to make sure that we are working with community colleges and uh, vocational training to get the right people skilled to, to do this important work. And so part of the planning of growing is making sure that we have the staff to do that. We are working on some legislation to uh, have the federal government play a role in, in supporting uh, community colleges to, to um, continue to train people. And then on, I'd, I'd just comment on the um, infrastructure piece. Obviously, this conversation is a, conti a continuing conversation here. Transmission uh, is important for solar for a couple of reasons. One, we want to make sure that we have uh, utility scale projects and being able to bring that power to the load base. And then also um, having the right policies in place when it comes to infrastructure. So whether it's bringing the distributed uh, generation onto the onto the grid in a, in a more uh, uh, fair way. And uh, also to, I'd say, take a look at the... Um, uh, the uh, other uh, policies that we need to do at the at FERC to make sure that we have uh, uh, good good ways to bring uh, com competition to the wholesale market. On South Carolina, 
I, uh, I would just say let's duplicate that in other areas. That would be the number one tool. And number two is that we obviously have great leadership when it comes to uh, the, uh, the House and Senate, and so making sure that they're uh, driving a train in terms of implementation and, and helping uh, to, to make sure that we put the, the current law in place in terms of where we should go next. I'll leave that to the South Carolinians at the moment to de decide that. Great. Well, I, I love your comments, Lena, on, on transmission. We didn't talk about that much, but uh, isn't it Infrastructure Week, by the way? <laughs> or, Again. <laughs> um, hey, every, I, I'd be happy if it were every week. Every um, week is infrastructure. Uh, two things about renewables, if you don't follow them closely, is you, you really do need to geographically connect uh, large regions to make it all work. Um, so these regional grid operators, you know, when the wind is blowing in one place, it might not be blowing in another, or the solar is blowing, is, uh, sh you know, uh, shining and producing when the wind isn't and vice versa, and the hydro uh, is there to fill in uh, all the gaps from, from, uh, from wind and solar, and you, you put it all together, but you have to do that on a large regional basis. So, you know, yes, I love my solar panel on my roof, but I don't want to be off-grid. We all need to be part of the uh, the large grid. In fact, we want that very, very large. So transmission infrastructure Great. and these, these uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, uh, yeah, these you know large uh, you know grid operations, um, uh, grid operators uh, can really do that. So for that, in terms of opportunities uh, coming up, um, and let's focus on South Carolina. A, a regional transmission organization for the Carolinas would be a great idea. If you really want competition, if you really want consumer choice. Uh, and you want to be able to rapidly uh, ramp up renewables, you, you've got to have an RTO. So getting the Carolinas kind of on the RTO bandwagon would be a, uh, a great development. Um, and I'll mention, uh, so in, the, in your packet there, we have a whole set of recommendations. Uh, I led this uh, report, a nice pretty picture here. It was for the Wind Solar Alliance. Um, it actually has a lot in common with what I think Jeff is going to talk about with uh, the hydro paper because, again, it's all about how do you put all the resources together in a reliable, efficient way. Um, uh, so on the back of this, there's a number of recommendations on how to design the RTO markets. And just to mention a, a couple here, um, respecting bilateral contracts and respecting state policy is something that you wouldn't think you have to argue about, but it's actually a very controversial idea, and there's uh, all kinds of litigation and debate at FERC. Um, I think Emily mentioned that uh, really the states are leading the way. They're advancing a lot of clean energy policies. That's completely true, and to make that work, I think the wholesale markets need to allow that to happen rather than trying to mitigate or undo what the states are trying to do. So I'll leave it there. <clears throat> well, I'm going to riff off a little bit of what was just said uh, by both of you on with regards to infrastructure uh, on something that I don't think is really known all that much, which is um, half of the hydropower generation in the United States uh, is owned by the federal government. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers is the largest uh, owner of hydropower, uh, followed by the Bureau of Rec Reclamation. So that makes the federal government the largest renewable energy producer in the country by far. Um, and so I do think that there are opportunities to... Um, uh, O&M opportunities, build out opportunities further on the federal system that we could be doing. And I would like to see uh, an initiative like that be part of an infrastructure bill or uh, an energy policy bill or whatever bill they would like to pass in order to, um, to look at that system. Then taking it back to a more higher level in terms of opportunities, I think with the opportunity that we have right now, um, with the renewed focus again on, 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 on the climate issues and also I think on reliability issues and the like is to sort of, as I said earlier, take a new look at hydro and have policymakers take a new look at hydro and break some of those old myths that people have about the industry that, you know, it's great what we have, but there isn't going to be any more. Uh, that, you know, we're not going to build new projects or, you know, that people don't even know what pump storage is, even though it's 95% of energy storage in this country. Um, the new technologies that we have in marine energy and small conduit opportunities, all of that stuff, I think we need to do a better job and our members need to do a better job of um, communicating that to policymakers, both at the federal and the state level. And it's tough because 
there are companies who um, are utilities or who own uh, a generation portfolio where hydro may only be 3% of their, their portfolio. So it's not the top priority for their organization. There are other companies that are 100% hydro. So um, I didn't bring this ahead of time, but I left copies in the back. There's a white paper that NHA just put out in April uh, called Reinvigorating Hydropower. It takes a lot of look at these policy issues, transmission issues, reliability issues, grid issues. So I commend that to you. And uh, if the cop the 25 copies go, that you can always get it on hydro.org as well. And you know, I think hydro has been the backbone of grid reliability for so many years. That's why we were able to see such a great you know build out of both wind and solar in the West, and particularly in the Northwest. So. I think the role that my industry plays is only going to grow more important. Um, but it's not necessarily true that we will always be there. If the policies at the RTOs and the ISOs at the state and federal levels don't support what we do economically, then you're going to see some projects potentially uh, decide that they can't operate in that environment. So, and, we, and that's a lose-lose situation. <laughs> Um, so yes, agreed with infrastructure. Um, I think you know within kind of the infrastructure framework, we certainly support siting and permitting streamlining. I mean, we have to be careful that the simplifications and changes we make to that process can withstand legal scrutiny and and um, don't fly in the face of our state's environmental goals. Um, we certainly don't want to unnecessarily cur unnecessarily curb environmental protections in our states. Um, but you know we are having as much trouble as anyone building infrastructure in our states, and so. Streamlining siting and permitting is incredibly important to the company. Um, I think the other thing we'd love to see is more regulatory stability around transmission. Um, we have had ROE um, filings sitting at FERC for quite a long time, in litigation for quite a long time, and so would love to have FERC adopt a new method of calculating returns for our transmission investments. Um, and the one they, the the um, proposal they put out in November 2018 is certainly one that we would support. Um, and then hydropower licensing, um, we national. Grid Ventures, that unregulated um, entity that I mentioned, has been investing in pumped hydro storage projects um, in the Pacific Northwest. And so we are very supportive of creating a new ITC for pumped hydro storage. Certainly the long-term exten extension of um, hydropower production tax credit, we support that. Um, and then again, I have to, ha have to highlight the um, electric vehicle tax credit, which we think is absolutely key to getting more electric vehicles on the road and reducing emissions in the transportation sector.